Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. Um, uh, the usual housekeeping members uh, welcome you to today's session and inform uh, all members that mobile devices are permitted, providing they're muted or in airplane modes, uh, and uh, the tablets and laptops should only be used for committee business during meetings. Can I ask the clerk to inform the committee of any notice received from a member who has delegated authority to another member of the committee to vote uh, on his or her behalf? None received. Okay. Uh, can I seek agreement to commence the meeting in open session? All agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Can I ask uh, Assembly Broadcasting to ensure the Starleaf meeting uh, is now being streamed? Live okay. now, yeah. That's great. Okay. Um, members, welcome to the 13th meeting of the Audit Committee. Uh, we have apologies from uh, Alan Chambers uh, and we have uh, apologies from uh, Emma Rogan. Uh, members in attendance today, um, uh, Joanne Bunting, uh, who is in person, I think, or uh, is yeah. Joanne in person? Kirk, yes. Yeah. And we have uh, Jim Allister and Jim, you're remote today. Yes. Okay. Um, can I remind members that they are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interest before and during each committee meeting? Can I ask, does any member have any interest to declare? No. no. Okay. Can I inform members that the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 14th of April are pages 6 to 11 of the meeting pack and ask members if they are content that the minutes are a true reflection of the proceedings of the meeting? Neither of you were. Yeah. Okay. Jim was in hand. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I should declare that I have ongoing complaint with the Ombudsman's Office about a couple of issues, but I'm just yeah. uh, complaining and so on. Okay. Th thank you much, Alex, for you, you've, you've put that on record in, in many occasions. Thank you. Um, can I inform members that uh, I will say in the minutes uh, in due course? Uh, moving on to the next item of business, I uh, can inform members that there are five items under matters arising of pages 13 to 29 of the meeting pack. Uh, items 1 and 2 at pages 13 to 17 of the meeting pack are responses to the Minister for Communities and Controller and Auditor General regarding the appointment of a single auditor uh, for the public sector. Uh, the Minister for Communities has expressed a view that it is the executive uh, or assembly uh, to, for, the, for them to decide whether there should be a single auditor for the public sector as it will require primary legislation. The CNAG has proposed provided further information on his proposal for a single auditor, including the areas where functions reach across both central and local government, uh, and details of accountability gaps because of the two separate auditors. Can I ask members that are content to note the information for now and consider at a later stage in our review? Members content? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Item three at page 18 of the meeting pack is a response from the CNAG in relation to the potential remit powers and membership of the statutory board uh, of the NIAO. Uh, that should uh, corporization uh, be prog progressed? Can I inform members that the CNAG will be invited to give evidence to the committee on its review uh, and members may wish to question him at uh, a later stage on that matter? Item four at page 24 of the meeting pack is a response from the Public Accounts Committee to the com committee's request for a view on the quality of service and performance of the NAO. The PAC has expressed that it is satisfied with the service provided by the Audit Office, which it regards as positive and very productive. However, the PAC agreed that it was premature to provide a full assessment of the service and performance of uh, the NIO due to the relatively short time frame in which the working relationship has operated. Can I ask members that are content to return to this matter closer to the end of the mandate to get a, fu a, a more fuller feedback? Members content? Yeah. Okay, and item five at page 27 of the meeting pack is a, re a record of the decision taking understanding order uh, 1159 to commission uh, research. Can I ask members to note? Yeah. Okay. Okay, and the uh, next item of business, the estimate 2122 in the Northern Ireland Audit Office. Can I refer members to pages 31 to 46 of the meeting pack for relevant papers uh, and correspondence with Department of Finance in the table pack? Can I inform members that the estimate presented is in line with the budget approved by the committee and that the Department of Finance and the POC have uh, not raised any issues? 
And can I also inform members that Mr. Rodney Allen, Director of the Northern Ireland Audit Office, will attend the meeting to brief members on the NAO <coughs> estimate for 2022. And with that said, uh, can I welcome Mr. Rodney Allen, if broadcasting could bring him in, uh, to brief members? Just Chair, uh, Mr. Allen is here in person. He's just oh, yes, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. <sighs> I can't uh, see anyone in the committee room, Clerk. I'm, I'm looking at myself, just that's the problem with it. <laughs> that is a problem. <laughs> Let me see. Is that okay now, Chair? No, uh, uh, well, yes, yes, that's yeah. it. There was just Mr. Alistair there. Up. I can see you, isn't it? Great. Thanks very much. Um, Mr. Allen, you're most welcome, as always, uh, and uh, I invite you to. Uh, brief members, and then we'll follow with a number of questions. So, uh, when you're ready, thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you, Chairman. Um, members, um, not, not much to say by way of introduction. I'll keep it reasonably short and, and sweet. Um, just the background, first of all, we came to you with our budget back in, in October and gave you evidence in October and December and gave you some written follow-up um, on that budget. Um, you wrote to the Minister in December approving our 21-22 needs of uh, resource around about 8.7 million and capital, big capital year for us around about 4.5 million pounds. Um, subsequently, the Department of Finance asked us to provide our estimates for 21-22, which we have done, and also sent them through the Department of Finance and the Public Accounts Committee and to yourselves for consideration, and that's what you have in front of you today. We have included in the short one-page um, summary a reconciliation of the estimate through to the budget to demonstrate to you that the estimate confirms and lines up with the figures that you have already approved. And you'll see there that the estimate was in resource terms totaling 8.590k. The consolidated fund standing charges or services, which is the essentially the CNAG's salary and his employer's costs, which are paid directly from the consolidated fund, agreeing back to the budget which you approved of 8.750k. So um, really just a note committee that the estimate requirement underpins year one of the new corporate plan, which you considered and kindly endorsed for us in March. And Chairman, those were my opening words. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll go to uh, Ms Bunting, if she has any questions for you, Mr Allen. I don't have any questions, thanks, Chair. We've been over this a few times now, so I'm content. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have. Um, OK, Mr Alistair. Just a couple of points, maybe more refreshers than anything else, but at page 40 of our pack, and the figure, these figures appear elsewhere, we have the contrast between the outturn of two years ago, 1920, with the provision required for 21-22, and in the resource side, that has jumped from 6.6 .6 million to 8.6 million. Two million jump in two years. Just remind us why that is. Uh, yes, Mr. Alistair, that goes back to us growing our, our staff base. So you had agreed to fund us this year for 120 full-time equivalent members of staff. Whereas if you look back over two years, our numbers had dropped as low as actually just below 100. We had 99 FTEs. So predominantly, as you know, 75%-ish of our budget goes on payroll costs. So in the main, that, that explains the difference. We're trying to grow that staff base up to 120 FTEs for this year. Which has the practical effect of reversing the voluntary exit scheme. In, in some respects, it, it will. It'll bring our numbers back up. At one stage, the Audit Office uh, had a complement of 145 FTEs. And as I say, we dipped below 100. And with the corporate plan intention, we'll come up to 125 FTEs. So we'll still be somewhat short of where we used to be. Um, I have to say I'm feeling a bit of frustration at the minute because we're, we're struggling in a very tight market to get our numbers up to 120. Um, so that's a, an issue that we're wrestling with um, and had a senior management team discussion on just yesterday. In terms of attracting applicants? Um, no, we've never found that a problem. Um, 
What we have found um, just recently is what I would describe as a dry market. Um, there, there, there are very few um, qualified accountants who would appear to be um, moving between employers. So I suppose you might say that means we're struggling to attract. We've never had that problem. So I think we're seeing something which is to a certain extent also COVID related. Um, you know our strategy, it has been to employ qualified accountants in tandem with growing our own through the um, graduate scheme and the apprenticeship scheme. Those are still proven to be very successful for us. But for once, the market, so if you have any, if you have any family or friends that are interested in being accountants, I think now's the time to get into that space. <laughs> well, my son's an accountant, but he's a long way away. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so taking a backward look uh, through the voluntary exit scheme, we spent huge amounts of money giving out handshakes to reduce staff. And then we started the process of recruitment again to bring us a century back up to where we started. Or almost, what therefore was the point of the voluntary exit scheme? We, we had a voluntary exit scheme which was somewhat different um, to that which was run by the civil service because we targeted it at the more senior grades. So what we did was we, we used it um, to restructure the organisation and we, the grades that left us were um, in the main from our senior auditor and, and above. Um, we have not Which filled made those. More expensive. They're more expensive. We have not filled those posts. So what we have done is when, when we've been growing the organisation back up again, we've recruited at the grades below senior auditor. So we've changed the staffing profile and the staffing shape of the organisation. We also have, Mr Alistair, um, we can demonstrate our, our payback on the voluntary exit scheme, so we, we, we're well beyond our savings point. Um, I don't have the details on that in front of me, but believe me, we have our payback a couple of times over, actually. On page 42, we also, we also see the, um, the outturn figure of 1920 on the capital expenditure of 168000 and provision this year of almost four and a half million. That's a very dramatic jump. Remind us why that is. Yes, no, no, normally we have, um, the committee approves a capital budget for the audit office, a very modest sum of 40,000 pounds. But over a, a five year period, and that's how long it lasts to go through the associated design and procurement, we are modernizing our premises in 106 University Street and you have supported us for that. We're now in, we're now in the arguably the, the heaviest year of that. So this is this is the the 21-22 year. We've we've 4.45 million pounds, 4.4 actually, in the budget that we intend to spend this year on that project. So the 168 that you're seeing in 1920 was the early expenditure incurred on the design. So you remember that we're we're using the um, offices of CPD and SIB yes. to guide us through that process and. Right now, we're in the middle of the tendering process, and we're expecting those tenders in um, towards the 21st of May, towards the end of this month. Uh, and of course, there'll be further excessive or extensive provision required next year. Yes. Not, not much, but yes, we've built that into the corporate plan, and you saw those figures when we brought our, our budget to you. Mm -hmm. So this is the big year. It's about £700,000 next year. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alistair, and um, thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, I have no questions. We've we've um, went over this in some detail, but I appreciate your uh, your update uh, and uh, your presentation to us today. And uh, thank you for your attendance. Thank you, Chairman, members. Okay, members, we'll move on to the next item of business, the Estimate 21-22 Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman. Uh, can I refer members to pages 48 to 63 of the meeting pack for relevant papers and correspondence to the Department of Finance in the table pack? Can I inform that the estimate presented uh, is in line with the budget approval by the committee and the Department of Finance uh, has not raised any issues. Um, can I inform members that Ms. Margaret Kelly, the Ombudsman, uh, Mr. Sean Martin, Acting uh, Deputy Ombudsman, 
and Mr. John McGinnity, Director of Finance and Corporate Services, will, will be attending the meeting to brief members on the NIPSO estimate for 21-22. Clerk, we have them remotely, is that correct? Yes? Yes. Uh, okay, casting, thank you. Me. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Margaret, uh, Sean and John, you're most welcome to be with us uh, 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 again. Sean, I think this is your first time with us, is it? In this capacity? No, in this capacity? No, I, think oh. I, have, I have been before. I had a problem with my camera, so I'll, I'll, I'll never forget it. <laughs> All right. Okay. okay, thank you. And uh, Margaret, you can hear us okay, yes? I can't. Sorry, Chairperson. I'm having a problem with my camera this afternoon, so my apologies um, that you have audio only for me. You're okay. You're okay. It's, as long as you can hear us and, and we can hear you, that's fine. So, uh, Mary, with that said, we, we'll um, invite you to brief members. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Chairperson and Committee. So just a very um, few opening words from me. Um, so just to say that we welcome the opportunity to look at the year end position and the estimates um, as per what we have sent you. Um, you will see that the preparation of our annual report and accounts is currently underway and um, that the Northern Ireland Audit Office will begin their year-end audit on the 11th of May, and we hope that that should be completed by around the 21st of June. And if all goes according to plan, that we should have sign-off um, by the CNAG at the end of June, and we would then be ready to give committee further evidence and more detail on both the accounts and annual report. Um, in terms of the main estimates. I'm going to ask John McGinnity to take you through a little bit of the detail of that. But as you will see, these estimates reflect the budget as discussed with and agreed by committee, um, including the adjustment in respect of the pay pressure for 21-22. And just before I ask John to do that, I would just like to draw to committee's attention um, that we are very hopeful that the complaint standards element of our legislation will be commenced this month. Um, so I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank the committee for their support in that and um, for really moving that along. And just to thank the Assembly Commission and particularly their staff for moving so promptly um, on that for us. And it will be great that we will have that so early um, in this new financial year. John, could I just ask you to say a few words on the main estimates? Yes, absolutely, Margaret. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to confirm to, to members that uh, the, the estimates for NIPSO, similarly to the Northern Ireland Audit Office, follow a very simple path, really, between what was agreed by the committee as our budget for 21-22, uh, and there's a, a, a very short table on page two of, of Margaret's letter, which sets out the, the level of the approved overall budget, which was agreed back by the committee back in December 20. Uh, and there are two adjusting items that then bring us to the, the level of the resource requirements for 21-22 that are identified in the estimates. Um, the other schedules within the estimates support the, the the key figure, which is the agreed level of resource requirement, which is 3.55 million for NIPSO for 21-22. Uh, I am, rather than going through each of the each of the supporting schedules, I, I, I would be happy to take any questions that specific members may have on, on any of the figure work or, on, or indeed on anything else related to the estimates. Okay, thank you uh, to each of you. Uh, we'll go straight to a few questions. Joanne Bunting, if broadcasting can. I mean, Chairman, no, we, I mean, we've been over this a few times, and Margaret has again provided a fairly comprehensive uh, briefing paper, so I'm content. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And uh, Jim Alistair? Just a couple of questions, if I might. Um, at page 54 of our pack, we see the, um, the resource to cash reconciliation. And again, if we look at the outturn figure for 1920, it was 2.6 million. First of all, 
what was the provision that year as compared to the outturn? And secondly, remind us why there is a approximately 35% ju jump from 1920 resource requirement to the current year. Um, I would need to check, uh, Member uh, Alistair, on the on the difference between outturn and, and final provision for 1920, and I can come back to the committee on that. Uh, I know that the difference was within two percent, uh, but the precise figure I don't have in front of me right at this moment. In terms of the movement of around 30 percent between 1920 and 21-22, it's largely attributable to our, the growth in staffing numbers over that period. We have moved from a, an average whole time equivalent in 1920 of 38 up to the low 40s. Uh, the, the precise figure we're working working it through at the moment for the as part of the preparation of the 21 was it, sorry the 1920. Uh, annual report and accounts, uh, but it, I know it to be in and around 42, so that, that's around a 10% increase. We also had an impact that in 1920 that, that hit us for the first time where there was a substantial increase in the level of, of employers' pension contribution, which also added, around, in our case, around 120,000 to our overall running costs. In other respects, uh, our, our non-staff expenditure has been running at a relatively even level over the three years, growing uh, by around 3% each year. So the, the major difference in, in terms of the, 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 what you point out uh, can be attributed to the growth of the organisation, the growth in the number of staff, and consequently the, the increase in overall expenditure that, that you highlight. And are you having any recruitment issues? Um, maybe Margaret wants to mm -hmm. say something about that, or, but I'm happy to offer what I can. Yeah, um, so we have gone out recently on recruitment and sometimes there is an issue for us around the speed of that recruitment and um, we've just recently completed a recruitment exercise and I'll maybe ask Sean to say a little bit about it um, and sometimes it's just about us getting staff in as quickly as we would want in having a one year budget. So when um, last year we were hopeful that we might have a three-year budget, one of the real benefits of that is that it gives you a little bit of space to actually manage if there is um, some staff turnover. And with one year, we have to try to react really very quickly in year to get that. Sean, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about the most recent recruitment. So yes, in the, I mean, a big proportion of our staff, as you might expect, are those who manage the complaints that, that we get. So um, probably around 50% of our staff are what we call investigating officers. And, and we have just recently recruited um, an exercise to recruit more investigating staff to, to deal with the numbers of complaints that we have. And that has been the area where we have had recruitment activity in the past, you know, because um, there have been opportunities for people and some people have, have progressed internally in terms of opportunities which has created vacancies, which have then needed to be filled. So, you know, we probably have an ongoing requirement just as part of our normal business to I recruit suppose, investigating suppose my, officers. I suppose my question was more targeted at, uh, are you attracting sufficient numbers and quality of staff? Are you having any difficulties in that regard? Um, I'm, I'm going to come in, Sean, and then you can come in. I don't particularly think we are, are we? And the most recent round has been very, I think, successful. Um, we do have a, that a group of investigation staff, Mr. Alistair, tend to be younger and earlier in their career. Um, so after a number of years, as you would expect, they tend to look for those opportunities to move on. And while some of people are unable to move on um, internally, obviously we're a small organisation and we can't accommodate everybody. Sean, I, I think if you want to say anything about our the quality of recruitment. 
So, so we, we we have a high caliber of of applicants for the posts, and certainly on our last round of recruitment, we filled all our vacant posts. So I think you know we're happy that that the methods we're using are attracting a high caliber of of applicant. And, and I think as Margaret has alluded to, at, at that graded post, we just have an ongoing requirement, but but we're not experiencing a particularly difficulty in attracting the people with, with the skills we need. Chair, I'm maybe straying a little, but I would be interested to know, just give us a snapshot of the sort of staff profile of the individual you're recruiting. Are they recent graduates? Are they where are they coming from, etc.? What skills are they bringing? So actually, we we have a very diverse range of of skills. So um, I wouldn't say we have any recent graduates. We're usually we're looking for experience of of being able to analyse and manage information as part of prior work and to be able to make judgment. And, and decisions on the basis of evidence. So we are looking for experience of that. So is that coming from the private sector? Or it, it, it's coming from both in terms of, I would say, a very diverse range of background. So we would have a lot of applicants from the legal profession who, who have worked in various capacities, um, both in legal practice and in, in other areas of work. So Don't you how badly the legal profession is going, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't like to call that <laughs> so so I'd say we we do, we we do actually and I think it's very helpful that we have people from quite a diverse range of backgrounds both you know public sector background private sector background you know with those core skills around gathering evidence assessing evidence and making decisions and presenting that in in a form of a report that, that people can understand how we make the decisions in judgment so people have that skill set in a huge range of, of roles and we don't narrow it you know we're yeah. just looking at people with those skills regardless of background okay thank you um, may I just come back uh, momentarily to mr Allister's question earlier about the yeah the 2019-20 outturn figure of 2604 and how that compared to the, the final provision for that year. Uh, the final provision for that year was 2643. So there was a, we came in under that by, by 39,000 pounds in that year. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. I, I, have, I have no questions. Uh, we've covered this quite comprehensively in the past, and uh, thank you to the three of you for your uh, presentations and uh, evidence today. Um, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, okay. Mr. Chairperson Committee. Thank you. Okay, members, um, we'll uh, move on to uh, briefings. Um, Sorry, following the of the, of the two here, can I remind members that the committee has a role in relation to the estimates of both the NIEO uh, and of NIPSO, and this is set out in the briefing papers provided by the Secretaries uh, at pages 31 and 48 of the meeting pack. Can I ask members if uh, they're content to agree to the NIEO and NIPSO estimates for 21-22? All agreed, yeah? Okay. And, uh, can I ask members agree to lay the estimates before the assembly and inform the Department of Finance of the outcome of the committee's deliberations? All agreed yet? Agreed. Okay, thank you, members. I can advise members that a report will be drafted and issued uh, to members to agree under temporary standing order 1159, uh, whereby it is possible for a standing committee to make a decision with a holding a committee meeting. The publication report will give effect uh, to the committee's function of laying the NAO and NIPSO estimates before the assembly. Okay, and uh, next item of business members, uh, budgetary oversight of parliamentary corporate bodies, a comparative perspective uh, research briefing. Um, the research paper can be found, members, on page 65 of the meeting pack. I can inform you that the paper details the e oversight and procedural mechanisms for scrutiny of parliamentary corporate body budgets across the UK jurisdictions. Um, okay, so. Uh, We'll invite uh, Orla 
Drummond and Rachel Keyes from Research uh, who are available to answer any questions that members have. Um, and uh, if broadcasting could bring uh, both in. Arla uh, and Rachel, you're most welcome uh, to be before us. Uh, and uh, thank you for being, being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to give a brief presentation, if that's okay. Yes, of course. Is that all right? Sorry, yeah. Okay, thank you. So the audit committee requested a comparative examination of key aspects and an oversight and procedural mechanism for scrutiny of parliamentary corporate body budgets. So the paper, as, as you said there on page 65 to 82, summarised the Northern Ireland Assembly Commission's hereafter referred to as the NIAC. Um, it examined their legislative basis, role and budget and the role of the audit committee in overseeing the budget. This was followed by an examination um, of oversight of similar budgets in Scotland, Wales, Westminster and the Republic of Ireland. I'll provide a brief overview of the paper and then Rachel Keyes, my colleague, uh, will answer any questions you may have. Um, so I'll begin. As you know, um, the NIAC is the Assembly's body corporate and has responsibility under Section 44 of the Northern Ireland Act um, of 1998 to ensure that the Assembly is provided with the property, staff and services required for the Assembly to carry out its work. In addition, Sections 47 and 48 of the Act direct that the Assembly shall pay members of the Legislature salaries and allowances which the Commission administers. As highlighted in a previous raid's briefing paper entitled In Your Audit Committee Scrutiny, A Comparative Perspective, the composition of the NIAC budget is unique, consisting of both controllable and uncontrollable spend. So, for example, the costs for MLAs are established under legislation and these costs cannot be controlled. So the Audit Committee has a role in the oversight and scrutiny of the NIAC budget and this has been documented in the Memorandum of Understanding which sets out the Committee's role in overseeing the development of the NIAC draft budget and when necessary any in-year amendments to that budget. During preparation of the draft budget the NIAC the NIAC obtains data and projections from the Department of Finance relating to the wider outlook for the Northern Ireland Block Grant. Taking account of these projections, the NIAC proposes its draft and presents to the Audit Committee. The NIAC attends Audit Committee meetings to give evidence on its draft budget. In advance, the Audit Committee receives written evidence from the Department of Finance on the outlook for the block grant and the Department of Finance view on the NIAC budget. Following this, the Audit Committee compile a report uh, on the NIAC budget and report to the Assembly. The other limited role for committee scrutiny of the budget is in your amendments. So the NIC prepares and submits its contribution to uh, monitoring rounds and the spring supplementary estimate. And there's an agreed threshold for audit committee scrutiny. If the thresholds are not exceeded, the NIAC will not seek the audit committee's view on its senior position. It has been proposed that the audit committee will be consulted only for adjustments of plus or minus 10% of the NIAC agreed budget for a given year. By way of comparison, the House of Commons Commission is responsible for the administration of the House of Commons, including the maintenance of the Palace of Westminster and the rest of the parliamentary estimate. Unlike the NIAC, the House of Commons Commission is not responsible for expenditure on member salaries, pensions and allowances. These are overseen by the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority. Members' pensions are considered by the Members' Estimate Committee. Oversight of the House of Commons Commission budget is the remit of the House of Commons Finance Committee, which considers expenditure on services for the House of Commons and has particular responsibility for the preparation and detailed scrutiny of the House's budgets. The Finance Committee meets once a month when the House is sitting and advises the Commission on a remit for each year's financial planning round, developing financial plans for future years, prepares draft estimates for consideration by the Commission and Members' Estimate Committee, and monitors spending against budgets during the year, and this is done quarterly. It also considers the adequacy of financial information for determining 
priorities and addressing any other matters referred by the Commission. In Wales, the corporate body is the Senate Commission and its budget is scrutinised by the Finance Committee. Similar to the NIAC budget, the Senate Commission must lay its draft budget before the Senate to allow scrutiny of its proposals by the Finance Committee. Following Finance Committee scrutiny, the Commission publishes a final report to be debated in plenary before a vote for approval by the whole Senate. A further role for the Finance Committee is the oversight of supplementary budgets. The Welsh Government have an informal agreement where any proposed supplementary budgets by directly funded bodies are first notified to and considered by the Finance Committee. The Welsh Government hope to formalise this function in standing orders in the future. During the Fifth Senate, there was a significant underspend in members' pay and expenses budget, and that underspend was utilised by the Commission to fund in-year investment priorities. The Finance Committee raised concerns about the lack of transparency, and it conducted an inquiry. This in turn led to the separation of funding, where any underspend was returned to the Welsh Government. In Scotland, the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body provides for property, services and staff. The Finance and Constitution Committee is the oversight body for the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body's annual budget process. Information about spending plans of the corporate body are made available to the Finance and Constitution Committee at an early stage. A draft budget is provided to the Committee and Scottish Government no later than the end of the first week in December and any substantive changes must be relayed to the Finance and Constitution Committee and Welsh Government. The Committee considers and reports on the Parliamentary Corporate Body as part of its wider budget scrutiny. Final expenditure proposals appear in the Annual Budget Bill, which is voted upon by the Scottish Parliament. In the Republic of Ireland, the Houses of the Oireachtas Commission is the corporate body that provides services for the Houses. Its main function is to oversee the running of the Houses of the Iraq Service. The Commission's budget is set through legislative process and the amount is voted for every three years. Once voted for, the Commission is responsible for implementing the budget. No other Oireachtas Committee are involved in the preparation of the draft budget. The Commission's role is to oversee expenditure a legislative board and is in effect the scrutiny body in terms of expenditure in year and must set the annual estimate of the Commission. The Public Accounts Committee provides for ex post scrutiny, so it oversees the actual spend of the Commission's annual budget. So if you look at pages 77 to 79 in your packs, I've provided a summary table of the differing jurisdictional approaches. Um, it's important to note that the oversight and procedural mechanisms for scrutiny of parliamentary corporate body budget varies within the five jurisdictions examined. Oversight of the NIAC budget by the Audit Committee closely resembles the approach of the Scottish and Welsh legislators, with two small differences. In Wales, there's an informal agreement where supplementary budgets are uh, notified to and considered by their Finance Committee. And in Scotland, the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body keeps both the Finance and Constitution Committee and the Scottish Government informed of any substantive changes to the Scottish Parliamentary Budget. So that's the paper in a nutshell. Um, and if anybody has any questions, if they'd like to address them to myself or Rachel. Thank you uh, very much, Arthur, for that very comprehensive uh, presentation. Greatly appreciated. Uh, and a huge amount of work has obviously been under that. So thank you very much. On behalf of the committee, uh, uh, Joanne Bunting, have you any questions for Orla or Rachel? Yeah, I do. Please, Chair, if that's okay. Ladies, okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you, ladies. Thank you very much for your your presentation. Can I just clarify, with regard to the House of Commons, um, that seems like a fairly complex system. I just want to be clear that I have fully understood, because it seemed to me, in part of it, that. In in some instances, the committees were the same members but wearing different hats. Uh, could you confirm that that is the case, or have I misunderstood? I can put that one, Chair. Um, yeah, they, it's the same membership across both of the committees, and they just have uh, slightly different roles. Right, and, and so on that basis, you don't know the rationale behind having two distinct committees with the same members. I mean, why, why would they not have one committee with, with you know, um, 
a jail rule in that sense? Do we know? Um, my understanding is that it's um, common practice um, and it, it, um, the, the same setup as in some of the other jurisdictions in, in different areas, so it, it wasn't um, relevant to include in this paper. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just the role of the committee is different. And in terms of um, what you have, I suppose what you have discovered about all this and what you've put down in paper for us, but presumably you, you've gone into some more detail than we have with regard to it. Um, do you see within our system any gaps or room for improvement? Um, I think the biggest difference between the systems is that in the other jurisdictions, um, a lot of the scrutiny is the responsibility of the Finance Committee. So obviously we have a Finance Committee in Northern Ireland yeah. and it would have sort of a more general oversight function. Um, and the thing that we have different is um, this additional standing committee, which is the Audit Committee, and it has oversight of three of the smaller budgets. So we do do things slightly differently. Um, and. Um, there's a possibility that this particular budget gets more scrutiny because there's um, that additional committee basically looking into it. So in terms of then, I suppose we've looked at the structures here and, and what they do. Um, the level of power and control and influence over budgets, is that similar? Um, you know, we, have, we have MOUs, for example. Um, yeah. What what do the others have? You know, because I mean, are kind of we're to some extent, to some extent, extent skimming the surface. Um, now we can drill down to some detail, but there are aspects that we don't look at. It's this is not a scrutiny committee in that sense. So, mm -hmm. what way is it in the other jurisdictions? Do they have more power than we do, and are the budgets more effectively scrutinised because it's a different format? Uh, a question that we did actually ask um, during this piece of research was um, about written agreements between the corporate bodies and the committees. And one of the reasons that there aren't written agreements between some of the committees is because the committee is the finance committee, so they have a different um, sort of level of scrutiny anyway. Also, the budgets are done differently. So, for example, um, you know, in, in the Republic of Ireland, um, there's very little. There appears to be little scrutiny of the corporate body budget by um, the houses of Oireachtas, um, just because they're sort of set every three years, and they they don't really have a, a an input at all during that process. Uh, the finance committees um, probably uh, gear most of their scrutiny towards the. Um, the, the larger budgets, and it's not clear if there's a special distinction uh, for the corporate body budgets. Yeah, I suppose I'm, I'm just trying to ascertain if, in trying to keep things separate, um, mm. whether then that in turn brings its own weaknesses into the system. But thank you very much, ladies. Okay, um, thank you, John. Uh, Mr. Alistair? So, looked at from the perspective of a corporate body wanting the easiest possible life, what of these systems would you choose? Um, I, I can try and answer that as well, Chair. Um, I'm not sure if that was in the scope of what we were asked to look at, but so the corporate body has sort of its own internal audit function. And then because it's sort of independent, it ha in Northern Ireland, there's a standing committee that, that looks at the, uh, that, that scrutinizes the budget. Um, in other jurisdictions, this is just done generally at the, uh, by the finance committee. So it's just a, it's just a different system. I'm not sure which one's, um, better, which one's more rigorous, or, um, you know, both the corporate bodies and the other jurisdictions also have their internal committees, um, and so they're scrutinised at the internal level and they're scrutinised sort of at, at, at the, um, in, in the parliament, so I'm not sure which system's better or, or, or whatever, but, um, they're, they're, you know, they're just, it, this paper simply highlights the differences between the two. In some of the others, there's greater opportunity, is there not, 
for scrutiny such as it is to get lost in the fog of a much wider ambit for those committees? Yeah, that, there's always a, an opportunity for that, I guess. Also, um, it's important to remember that in Northern Ireland, the committees involved sort of during the drafting of the budget as well, which isn't always the case. Mm. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Oster. Uh, thank you, Rachel and Orla, for uh, being with us today and for your very comprehensive presentations and for taking questions. Uh, we appreciate it, um, and uh, thank you for your attendance. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, members, um, I have to remind you that the committee has already discussed commissioning legal uh, advice and codifying the committee's role in relation to the Assembly Commission's budget, but decided to wait until the completion of the full budget cycle. Um, can I ask? My camera froze there. Sorry, folks. Did, did you hear that? Okay. No. No, you dropped out at my end. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think it, it completely froze. I'll just re uh, cover that again. Can I remind members that the committee has already discussed commissioning legal advice and codifying the committee's role in relation to the Assembly Commission's budget, but decided to wait until the completion of a full budget cycle. Can I ask if members are now content that the clerk liaises the legal service to form the commission uh, the legal advice? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, members, uh, we'll move to the next item of business, the scrutiny schedule. Can I refer members to page 83 of the meeting pack for the, uh, for the schedule? Can I inform members that the next two uh, meetings will focus on hearing evidence as part of the committee's review? Can I ask members if they're content to note? Great. Noted. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, moving on to correspondence members, can inform you that uh, there is one item of correspondence at page 88 of the meeting pack, a copy of the correspondence uh, to ministers. Um, if members have seen it, are they content to note? Yes? Yeah. Okay, and um, next item of business members, any other business? Members of any other business to raise? No. No. Okay, thank you. And the final item is the date, time, and place of the next meeting. You can inform members that the next audit committee is on the 2nd of June 2021. Uh, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much, members, and thank you, Clark. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Assembly, committee room 29.